Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Big Bros Podcast. My name is Jeremy. I'm joined again by my lovely friend and co-host, Ilan. And more importantly, we are joined by the co-founders today of Toolbox Education. Hello, welcome. Tell us about yourselves. It's great to have you guys on the show. Thanks, guys. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. It's really fun. Um, so, yeah, we, we found, co-founded Toolbox Education. And basically what we do is we've taken the tools that you would learn with a psychologist and we give those tools to kids in a way that they can relate to and um, use before they hit a challenge instead of waiting to go see a psychologist and then only and only then learning those tools that sounds fantastic because i feel like most times when mental health issues do arise that's usually when we decide to go see a psychologist it's like the same thing you injure yourself you go to a physio but what we like about toolbox especially are kind of those proactive approaches what inspired that sort of direction yeah definitely i should say i'm david and this is ben we should introduce ourselves um so i'm a psychologist and the, 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 the origin story sounds made up, but it's real. A few years ago in lockdown, when all you could do was just run with your friends, Ben is in a running group with my older brother, and I tagged along one cold August, I think it was August morning, and we just got chatting. I was telling him about, telling him about the clients I see, telling him about like, the tools and strategies that I'm using. Ben was telling me about his nieces and nephews, how hard lockdown's been. Uh, I don't know if it was like the run is high or like the coffee afterwards, but just ideas were flowing, ideas were buzzing. And we kind of just landed on this point of like, why are we waiting? Like there's massive wait times to see someone like me, to learn the tools, to deal with their challenges. Like it's all backwards. Like why can't we take this stuff, teach it to kids, like we said, in a fun, relatable way up front. So we have these tools. Mm. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. So that it sounds like it was a passion that was kind of maybe brewing for a while for you guys. And it was a matter of just the time being right coming out of lockdown, especially a time period we often reflect about where there's a whole lot of things arising, both mental and physical health and well-being socially as well. So was it just a matter of the time being right and it was something that you guys were talking about for a while? I think personally for me, I was sitting in uni learning all of these things. And it, you know, to study, to become a psychologist, it's a long time. It's four years of undergraduate, it's an honours year, then it's two years of master's. So it's like a huge time to get there. And finally, in my master's year, I was sitting there going like, why have I only heard of this now? Like, this stuff is so relevant for every single person at every stage of life. Like, why are we the psychologists, the psychologists, the, the gatekeepers? Like, why is this information not being taught to as many people as possible? It's funny you mention it because I'm doing my honours now in psych. And you probably remember better than most is that the four years of your training is mostly as a data scientist being able to kind of just know how to read research papers really be a critical thinker but when you're kind of in that master's phase that's when you get kind of the true experience of what it is to be a psychologist with placements and learning about different mental health issues and something that you mentioned just before during lockdown is that a lot of kids were facing a lot of kind of issues especially you know in school you're being dislocated from your environment what do you find even now when you do present those workshops are some of the biggest and most common challenges yeah it it varies i mean particularly through lockdown and through covid it was a sense of um there was a lot of fomo or just general overthinking or anxiety about all sorts of different things so we would speak to schools we would speak to kids and the things that were popping up so much when we were running sessions for students while they were still in lockdown was like um you, you know when you don't have that social connectedness and you don't have the opportunity to do things that a normal year seven eight or nine might be doing on a weekend you're stuck in your bedroom you're on your laptop all day and you, you can really overthink the world and you know all the problems in it and what's so crucial at that age is that social interaction and learning the skills of how to talk to people how to make friends what happens at parties like you know um how to respond to challenges resilience those sorts of things do you find that most students are receptive to the workshops because oftentimes we don't tend to naturally validate mental health as a serious conversation especially when we're younger I think it's only when we're kind of going through our lifespan, we decide, yeah, it's something that we need to take care of. What do you find the students' attitudes are towards that sort of conversation? They're really open to it. And I think the reason why they're so receptive towards it is 
at the start, we, we were trying to be really explicit about what we were talking about and kind of, I mean, mental health can be like, and, and the tools that we're, we're teaching kids, like it can be a taboo topic or people don't want to talk about it. And so what we found is that most 12, 13, 14 year old kids, they want to have fun and they want to like have a great time with their friends. They're really concerned about what the social group thinks of them. And so really quickly we realized like, first and foremost, we've got to relate to them. So we've got to take the concepts that David's teaching in a, you know, in a one-to-one client session and make it fun. The second thing we had to do was make it relatable to them. So whether that's scenarios that they've experienced um, in year seven or eight and actually speaking to kids at that age, like what have you gone through and when does this pop up? So that we could then hopefully integrate that into our workshops. And what that meant was like, if we were saying to kids, hey, hands up who's ever had, the, you know, someone hasn't replied to your text before and you start thinking, oh, what's happened? Like, why haven't they responded to me? Every hand in the room started to go up and they started to look around and go, oh, wow, like everyone's in the same boat. Like, I'm, I'm not crazy. This is, and that brought them in. And then they started to go, oh, hang on a second. Like, not only is this, is this fun, but I connect, like this is worthwhile to me. Mm. This isn't just some other boring speaker who's who i'm not it, it's not relevant to me yeah i love that because when i think of you know this is not to bash the experiences i had in school when talking about mental health and when we had guest speakers come in but i always remember it was you know we would have a period off a speaker would come in we'd be sat in in an auditorium we'd be in rows and they would just be blabbering along for about 45 minutes and everyone's silent the whole time it's not interactive Sometimes there would even be like anonymous question boxes coming around. And I feel like that already creates this um, kind of separation amongst the group. So it's so good to hear that you guys have worked out a way to collaborate and to build a community. Um, And for, for young kids, especially, that's exactly what they would want. And I feel like you would, you'd probably find that it might start off with only one hand going up and then another one. And then all of a sudden it's just like a snowball effect and everyone's just getting involved. And I think that's the best way to attack it. Yeah, definitely. I'll say as well, like we take a very intentional approach. We're not going, okay, this workshop only applies to people that have gone to see a psychologist before and have a diagnosis or label of anxiety or depression. Like mm. we don't come from that angle. We come from the approach of, hey, we're all human. We're all, we've all, we're all teenagers. We're all kids. We've all been here before. Who's been through these experiences? We're all going to have uncomfortable thoughts, big feelings that are hard to deal with. And that's where we come in. And of course their hands are going up because they've all experienced this, just like we all have and continue to as well. And out of curiosity, what is usually the age range that you guys uh, do workshops for? Yeah, definitely. So we run workshops from year five all the way to year 12. But I'd say the main focus is year seven, eight, nine. So that middle school. And we really see... Like that's where puberty, adolescence really kicks in. And we really see a change. So you see in year five and six, year five and year six, those students there are a lot more happy to share. They don't have that social awareness yet. They're, 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 they're let's call it pure. They're, ha- they're so excited to play games and hands up. And then you see in year seven and more, year eight, year nine, suddenly become really aware of the group. How am I fitting in? What's happening there? Do I want to be different? And often when we ask questions, you see kids looking around going, is this safe for me to put my hand up? And they do. And then everyone does. And it's like, that's where the magic happens. That's so interesting because I feel like generationally different age groups behave in different ways. Like, do you find that when you were in year seven, you had similar sort of issues or similar sort of kind of conversational points that were causing you distress? Or do you find that it's kind of very common even back when you were in year seven and whatnot i would say the root of it is really common it's a lot to do with these uncomfortable thoughts big feelings but really like socially like how am i fitting in how are my friends perceiving me how am i doing at school what's happening at home all of that stuff is still the same of course with like social media and other things going on that slightly changes the flavor to it but i would say it's the same and it's almost been um, amplified because of COVID where so many schools are saying to us now, like our kids are two or three years behind developmentally and socially, and they're really struggling with the friendship stuff or there's so many little conflict issues in the year level. Our kids don't know how to make friends or respond to challenges or um, issues. And so, I mean, ultimately it's it's just an amplification of what, people have experienced for 
for years and years, which is like, what do people think of me? Am I fitting in within the group? Um, you know, am I wanted, needed, loved, all that kind of stuff. And so, I mean, even with your audience, people who have just finished school going through the same thing with social media and, okay, did this person like my um, Instagram post or like, did anyone watch my TikTok or any, you know, that kind of stuff. Has, has this person responded to my text? Like we think those tools are just as valid for, for anyone, let alone a year seven or eight. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think you've nailed the point there. It's kind of magnified um, as you get a bit older from a different perspective. I know it's something that I've spoken about personally on the podcast before, but when I was in year eight, that was the that was for me the crappiest year for me in school. That was the year where I was considering moving schools because there was a lot of um, social dynamic differences, a lot of maturity differences, and I feel like that's something that you know is probably relevant and prevalent across all schools, all ages. So I knew I wasn't alone. I knew it wasn't just me, but at that time, you kind of feel like it is just you. So I think again, that's another incredible point um as to why you guys are targeting year sevens and year eights um from you know from that those perspectives because i feel like it's something that they're all experiencing at the end of the day they're all going through those maturity differences some are going up some are staying down and i feel like that's where the animosity is caused and um i guess what are some of the ways that through your workshops you try to target those um maturity differences or just heightened issues that might be different from, you know, the perspective of a year 12 student or a year five student. How would you target it differently to like a year seven, year eight student? I mean, ultimately it comes down to the scenarios that they're going to relate to the most. So there's different content and different tools that are required at, at different points. But, you know, if you take your example, feeling like you, you might leave school, the school, move to another school, year eight, you overcame that challenge you would have had all of these different emotions and thoughts like am i fitting in here you know should i leave all that kind of stuff but you overcame it you overcame that challenge that obstacle and it kind of you, you kept it in your memory bank the next time that something happened to you and there were obviously some tools that you picked up along the way to kind of deal with it and so what we do is we kind of take the the tool like whether that's from one modality of psychology or another, we try and make it as relatable to that age group as possible. Mm -hmm. So for, as an example, like you ever like binge a show on Netflix yeah, <laughs> and you get to the end of the series and like it's two o'clock in the morning, you've watched six episodes in a row and like, you're like, when did this happen? Like I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm going to yeah. be exhausted for my uni lecture tomorrow oh, yeah, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> and, but there's that little button in the corner that goes to the next episode. You know, mm. that one I'm talking mm. about, but you don't, and it already it, starts going. and it's already gone yeah. to the next episode before you've even chosen to click it. We kind of like, we use that metaphor with kids, um, you know, year eight, year nine, year 10, cause they're, they're all on net, you know, they're watching YouTube or Netflix all yeah. the time. And we say like the videos that play in your mind are a lot like Netflix. The thing is, you don't often click on them. They just go to the next episode for you. Mm. And that's where we're often like passive um, participants in our own mind. And what we show them in one of the workshops is around like when that movie pops up, how do you pause it and come back? Because it's going to keep playing. Like if, if you just say, I'm not going to think about it, the video will play. Mm. But are there ways to pause it? Are there ways to like, share it with someone so that it's not in your mind all the time are there ways that you can check if the video has been edited from mm. reality because it probably isn't what actually happened mm. as much yeah oh that's such a terrific tool to to implement and one that i've never thought about myself but could be so relatable to kids so how do you put that in practice in the classroom um because i can imagine that you know just by talking about it sometimes to a 14 15 year old it kind of might be in one ear at the other at times. So is there like, is there like a game you would do for that or are they like pairing up? So what are they actually doing to, to yeah. target that? Great question. And in terms of that particular workshop, I mean, we start with fun. So we go, hey, like what shows are everyone watching right now? And they're sharing and it's Brooklyn Nine-Nine and it's, I don't know, Squid Game or whatever else it is, Wednesday. And it just, just starts with a conversation. Then we play another game, a bit of trivia, like guessing how many subscribers Netflix has. 
And from there, we start getting the bind, we start getting the fun, the hands up, we're building that rapport. And from there, we, we kind of go like, like Ben said, our minds are a bit like Netflix. And we get, we go, let me explain to you what I mean. Like, has anyone here ever been, and I'm sure this has happened to you, this happens to me all the time, you're lying in bed, you can't fall asleep, you're tossing and turning, you've flipped your pillow to the cold side like five <laughs> times because your mind is just like replaying you something embarrassing you did or said from earlier that day. The time you called your teacher mum <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or like, like <laughs> did something embarrassing in front of you. Or like right. you're hanging out with a group and like you had a great time for three hours and the one joke didn't land and that, that stuck yeah. with you. It's like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And that's what you're focusing. You're not focusing on the four hours of, of hanging out with your mates. Yeah. And then all the hands shoot up. And then I love to go. And then does whose mind does this? Whose mind then starts thinking about all the other embarrassing things they've ever done in their life. Like it's a compilation movie and how they're the most embarrassing person. And all their hands shoots up. So we, we're going with those real examples that we've all been through. And they, their eyes light up. It's like, how? It's like, David, how do you know this happens to me? Like that's kind of like, whoa. They've been like, it feels a lot of response. like, whoa, this feels personal yeah. as a joke. Like, is this a personal attack? Then we talk about. I mean, sport and performance is such a big part in, in teenage life. Who's ever missed that shot, missed that penalty, missed that buzzer beater, missed that dance move, I don't know, missed the note, whatever it is. And they're like, yes, and whose mind keeps on playing that back to them as if it's like you're, as if like you're reliving it. Like, yes. And then we talk about a social example. Who's been left on red? Yeah, we've all been left on red. Whose mind then creates all these reasons why we've been left on red? Was it bec- your mind starts going, oh, what was, what was the last thing I said to that person? Are they annoyed at me? Or, so we created this whole narrative and then they reply to you and it's like, oh, never mind. So it's just sharing that, getting that buy-in, going, oh my gosh, that happens to me. And once they see it and once they recognize that it doesn't make them feel particularly good, it's there. It's not about thinking positive, everything's going to be okay, let me just think positive. Like that's not the point of our workshops and I think a lot of things. Um, but let's just recognize that we all go through this and here are some practical things we can we can do. What I love about that, what you just described there is like that tendency to ruminate, to keep replaying constant thoughts, negative ones over and over in our head. And I feel like even as a teenager, as you said, we all have experienced it, but you do it from a place of kind of, it's like you're, it's passive, but you also think that the more you think about it, then you may come up with a solution, like the whole idea that you'll change your mind with your mind. You'll think that by thinking about it constantly, you'll come up with a solution. Mm. And I like that what you're doing there is if someone would have told me when I was like 15, 16, that you can't, that's not the perfect solution. The best thing to do about is like to forget about it in a different way, try some sort of strategies that you can stop those rum, like ruminative patterns. I would have really like, um, I would have really, uh, what's the term? I would have really benefited from it, really, because it's 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 not an easy thing to stop, especially when you are in those kind of younger years. There's so much going on. But then just on that point, like we also go through the idea that not all thoughts are facts. Okay, so not every single thought that you get is pure fact. Mm-hmm. And so we explain, like we talk to students about spam like do you guys, you get spam messages yeah. on your phone all, all the time. time. You know, like the ATO wants oh. you to do this and you've got this Oz Post delivery at your yeah. door. It's yeah. like, how do you know that it's spam? Like you, most of the time we know, right? Like we can see the message and we go, okay, I know that this is just some random guy in another country mm. trying to scam all my money. We get spam messages in our mind as well. And we click on the link in them and we go down the rabbit hole. And so it's just that remind, like, again, using that metaphor of the phone or something that teenagers would connect with to, to identify like, cool, not every message, not every thought that we get in our minds is going to be true or a fact. And we don't necessarily have to click on it. And like you said, ruminate and believe it. And, but we still do. Mm, that's terrific. I think that those analogies are so superb, um, so relatable. Are they always... Are the students always receptive towards them? Are, they, are there ever times where students challenge you and challenge your beliefs in the classroom or is it generally always taken um, with agreeance? I mean, I'll say most people really get on board with it, especially how we do it with those examples, with the Netflix metaphor, with the phone metaphor. Some students will challenge yeah. and, and I think that's great. It's awesome because there's a, there's a learning opportunity there. Mm. And like this, enrich, like this enriches the class. This makes it so deep and meaningful. Mm. And something that, I mean, we, we teach our presenters and I always hold in mind, it's like if, if a student isn't um, so interested in the tool or is challenging and pushing back, 
that's okay. Like maybe they're not at a stage yet to fully comprehend it and that's fine. And maybe this experience is opening a door maybe down the track to go, oh, when David came in, I see where he was coming from. Mm. And that's where we can see the learning that can take place. Well, it seems that, you know, even kind of communicating these ideas, there needs to be some sort of degree of skill. And that's, you say you do that through your presenters. What does that facilitator job involve? So we've very deliberately chosen um, a specific cohort or demographic to deliver the workshops. And they are first, second, third year uni students who have just finished high school, who are relatable to the kids, who are pretty close in age, but have kind of crossed that bridge of finishing school. Um, They're not necessarily psych students, although a large portion of our presenters are just because they're interested in the topic. But um, we're looking for people. It's a it's a great casual part time uni job on your days off from uni. You might present two or three days a week, going out to schools all across um, the city or the state, and just see a whole bunch of different things. Learn incredible skills, um, public speaking, facilitation, customer service, all that kind of stuff um, that we we teach them and train them in. Yeah, that that sounds fantastic. That's something that I know I can really relate to. I've never. I've never facilitated something myself like in a workshop classroom scenario, but, you know, I have been on Camp America before and that was probably the first time for me where I was really um, in that environment of working with kids that are a little bit younger than you, but you really do see such growth in them and a tendency for them to really relate to you, you know, just being that little bit older, they really do relate to you um, and they... I feel like they really lock ears and really hone in on what you are saying versus someone who's, you know, a, an older teacher in the classroom. So I, I can really relate to that. And um, it's no doubt that, you know, people would love to get on board with that. Do you find that um, the facilitators, they, you know, are, are they all are they all friends themselves or like are there um, events that you guys run where, you know, they can kind of get to know each other a little bit better and talk about their experiences as well? Yeah, firstly, I want to say about the point with who comes into the classroom. It's really intentional, like Ben said, that we want that slightly older person who just finished school because as soon as that person walks into the room, there's that element of relatability. There's that connection. Kids have so many people in their lives who tell them what to do. They have parents, they have teachers. And if a parent or teacher is coming in and saying, hey, use these tools, they're going to say, no way, go away. There's just that natural defiance, right? But as soon as a young person walks in who's not wearing skinny jeans anymore, because that <laughs> happened to me, and a kid was like, you're wearing skinny jeans, that's, that's not cool. I was like, damn, that hurts my feelings. So yeah, <laughs> it hurts, it, it hurts. Um, they're like, oh, this person, I can see this person. This is relatable, I understand. And they're using the, la- the same language. They're watching the same videos. This be- it, it makes such a difference. And to answer your, your, your next question about like what's going on with the team, we really value that culture. Like Ben said, we're all, they're all university students. They're all the same age. We bring the team in for training. It's really important. We're going into schools often as a group. We're hanging out in between sessions. We're debriefing. We're, we're learning together. But also at the end of the sessions, we're, we're, we're talking about what's going well. What are people challenging with? We really want to have that supportive working environment because that's what makes work fun. And I think what draws a lot of people to it and probably a lot of your audience and why they're drawn to your podcast as well is that sense of doing something that's a bit beyond yourself. Um, You know, when you're studying at uni, it's a very like um, self-focused endeavor. You're learning something just for for, for your career and it's a noble pursuit. And I think part-time or casual work alongside uni can be tricky to find that sort of hits that sweet spot of fits around my uni degree but also gives me that sense of meaning purpose something beyond myself and I think what being a facilitator does in a room it's like I think the when you see a good facilitator go from good to great they're not the center of attention in the room. Like they are able to facilitate the conversation. Mm. They're not walking out as the hero of the workshop. Wow, everyone look at me. I think that's more of a presenter. Like mm. let's all look at them. Facilitation is all about making the art, like the students or the participants have their own realizations and for them to really lead it. So it works so nicely for these people who might be 19 20 21 still figuring out what their kind of 
what they what they want to do to get some skills where they're enabling other people to come up with the answers themselves mm -hmm. that's yeah terrific and i think an interesting point you mentioned there about you know the facilitators themselves is being you know 19 to 23 and still figuring out what they want to do is that a common theme that you find especially like the year 11s and year 12s they're often thinking about you know being in in the vca years they feel so much pressure about what it is they want to do but then i guess when they you know they come in and they have a fantastic facilitator that them themselves they're still working out what it is they want to do so is that an is that a theme that's often spoken about in in the workshops with those kids in the upper year levels of school definitely it's it's you've nailed it so well i mean there's so much pressure like they really feel like oh my god i've got to get my year 11 subjects right so year 12 which gets me the good atar score which means i'll get into the degree i want which means i'll have the job that i want which means i'll earn enough money and and we're constantly talking about that we call it catastrophizing or, or fortune telling and when we can get kids to realize that hang on this is just one sack in year 11 and it's a you know one two subject that really just lowers the anxiety lowers the the pressure lowers the stress and helps them just almost like break the task down step by step all i need to do is just spend an hour or answer these five questions and suddenly that's way more manageable than going okay if i don't get this question right on a thursday night the night before my sack i'm gonna be homeless like <laughs> there's a massive difference there and we, and we can and we, of course our brains do that because it's, it's we're trying to protect ourselves yeah. and think about every scenario but if we can just guide our mind our thoughts back to okay what's the next step i need to take the rest will take care of itself we're doing okay Look, honestly, when I was in year 10, I think I was a serial A um, catastrophizer because I had that exact same yeah. experience. I was thinking, do I pick math methods for my one, two in year 11? Because that might have an impact on whether I do commerce or not. Even at uni, I decided to make a degree change. I wanted to go from doing law arts to going into psychology. And at the time, of, I wish I could have just tell, told my year 10 self, have a little bit more perspective, see the big picture. As you just like beautifully said, it is just about that next step. And I find that as we get older, it's, it's one of those kind of gifts of wisdom. It's knowing that the most important thing in life sometimes is your health. It's not necessarily the degree you do. It's not necessarily the job that you have, but rather it's you know those fundamental things like your health. That's something that's personally helped me. Do you guys find that when you're delivering those workshops that there is that emphasis on building a perspective, looking at the big picture rather than getting stressed about those little things? And if so, what kind of strategies do you guys employ? It's not as much of a focus in our workshops, uh, the, the kind of perspective taking purely because we don't know what kinds of challenges each student in the room is going to be facing. And for that reason, we take a more general approach and kind of there are topics with tools attached to them when it comes to anxious thoughts, overwhelming emotions, emotion regulation, um, you know, the videos that our minds play for us on repeat. And then we can start to use some of the tools that evidence-based psychology will suggest that you use. Mm. But we don't often, and we, we don't necessarily take the path of like, trying to give life lessons to students because we don't want to be as prescriptive or um you know come in and give these grand speeches i mean we called it toolbox for a really simple reason we were like they the students might not walk away with using all six of these tools from this hour if you walk away with one just like a tradie like might not use every tool on the shelf um, every single day but if you leave it on the shelf it's going to gather dust so like try use one or two um, if you want to so what i'm kind of hearing you saying there is that you recognize that the students they're the experts of their own life you don't want to give them a prescri prescription of what to do you kind of want to just give them those tools that enable them to do what they can for their own unique situations 100 percent, and that's what these tools really do these tools can be used as like I think in an unproductive way where they're really like dogmatic and prescriptive. It's like, hey, use this and this will be okay. I think what's really powerful is when we use, hold these tools with compassion 
and we really get kids to reflect and use them in their own life and come up with their own answers. Mm. And that's a big challenge for me as a psychologist. Often I'll be with a client and I'll have an opinion or perspective of what I think the right thing to do is, but it's not about what I think. It's about helping them come to their own conclusion and, and, and figure it out for themselves. And it's through that, it's the experience. Through the experience, emotionally, physically, whatever, mentally, that's going to make the change and the impact and the difference. What has been, and this is a question to each of you, what has been, I guess, the biggest surprise that you each have experienced from these workshops with kids? What has just blown you away? What is something that you, you didn't really expect to experience getting into this that has really just blown your socks off and surprised you both about this whole experience? It's an awesome question. I think for me, it's being in that classroom and one of my favorite moments is when I go hands up who's whose mind has ever sent this had that thought like I'm not good enough or whatever and everyone's hands shoot up and you have the popular kids and the not so popular kids and whatever everyone in the classroom and all of their hands are up and I love to go just before I say anything else year sevens you're right it's just like let's just pause look around the room every single one of us here myself your teachers and everyone here has had this experience like it's not like like you were saying before it's not just you all of us and just that and we see that in the feedback often the kids right uh, it made me realize I'm not I'm not alone mm. it's not just me and for me that is like so powerful mm. and that's even before and then we add the tools on top and now we're laughing now it's amazing that's amazing as you just said for any people who kind of want to do and become a facilitator and they're thinking what kind of transferable skills can I take because I might be studying then I want to get a full-time job but how can toolbox enable me to have these transferable skills that I can take into full-time work? What would you say to them? I think the the job of being a, a facilitator teaches you, like we said before, how to bring the best out in other people, um, how to help them arrive at their own conclusions. And, you know, even you guys in your own lives and in your social groups and in the jobs you do or even at uni, ultimately, like the... This, those kind of soft skills which we call the emotional intelligence side of things happens when you're able to go beyond yourself and like get the best out of other people that's what that's what management is or coaching or anything like that leadership and so I think you know that there's lots of jobs out there that will teach you how to follow a, a rigid set of rules and do this in order to get this outcome whereas we're teaching our facilitators how to think on their feet, how to problem solve in any situation, how to maintain or manage the energy in a room so that people learn different things. I mean, you don't have to be a teacher to teach people things. And that's the message we want to get across. And I think there are a lot of people who become facilitators with us who didn't expect that they would end up doing something like that or who weren't necessarily passionate about psychology or um, that kind of thing that but realize whoa like I can I can get heaps out of this and I mean the point that we're at now we, we started a year and a half ago year and a half to two years ago we're almost at, at about 100 schools across Victoria that use the program and um, we, we're just about to open up in Sydney and Brisbane so there's massive opportunity we've just hired our first full-time staff member um, and you know whether that sales customer service operations recruitment like we're kind of going in that direction so we want more people on the journey with us who 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 want to build something really from the ground up and be involved and I think the best way to do that is by learning some of those facilitation skills ben david thank you that is terrific it's so great to hear about the work you guys are doing with students in the classroom out of the classroom and the differences that you guys are making on their lives um, and it's also so exciting to hear about the growth of Toolbox and, and where the future is heading for you both. So congratulations, well done. Where can people find you and where can they go if they do want to be a facilitator for you guys? Yeah, you can follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, if you're interested in applying, head to our website, tool toolboxeducation.com. There's a little apply now button and we'd love to see some applications come through and meet you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, once again, thank you for coming on. Guys, if you've enjoyed this episode of the Big Bros Podcast, please don't hesitate in rating the show five stars. Like, subscribe and follow us on all platforms. We hope you enjoy. Have a good one.